Hello, this is Professor Elick with U.S. Government Chapter 8, uh, the Presidency and the Federal Bureaucracy. Let's get to it. Now, as you know, um, today, when I go through this lecture, and all of these lectures, I use PowerPoint, and I don't really like it. However, it's a good outline for these videos. And uh, so it's something that it's there, we'll deal with it. But let's talk about the presidency and the bureaucracy. As you know, we just went over chapter seven, uh, the executive branch. And um, the executive branch is what it is. It is that second institution created out of Article Two of our Constitution. The executive branch is where the president sits and governs over. As you know, the president, he vetoes legislation or approves it. The president also execute any laws that Congress approves and becomes law or execute or enforce anything that the judicial branch uh, approves or orders. Now the president with this, in order to take out or use or to fulfill the policies of not only the presidency of themselves, but of Congress and of the judicial branch, the president refers all this work down to uh, the bureaucracy, the federal bureaucracy. So let's look at it from this way. As you know, everything that is created in Congress, if it becomes, it's a bill that eventually becomes a law, the law is signed in, uh, the law is approved by the president, then it has to be applied to the country. But how does that get done? Well. This gets done through the bureaucracy, the individual departments under the presidency in the executive branch. They do the day-to-day -day operations of the federal government, be it the military, be it Homeland Security, be it uh, House and Human Services or Veterans Affairs. They talk directly to the people back and forth. And they get things done. However, some people uh, complain about them because it seems like they don't get things done fast enough, efficiently enough, or the way that most citizens want to get things done. But the day-to-day -day operation, how the federal government actually touches you every day happens in the federal bureaucracy. Let's get to it. Let's go to the PowerPoint. Now, chapter eight, the executive branch and the federal bureaucracy. Our objective is to outline the development of the federal bureaucracy, describe how the federal budget is organized, describe how the federal bureaucracy is staffed, identify the roles and responsibilities of the federal bureaucracy, and identify the means of controlling the federal bureaucracy. Uh, the roots of the federal bureaucracy, the civil war and the growth of the government, from the spoil system to the merit system, regulating commerce and the world wars and growth of the government. The civil war and the growth of government. Permanent changes to the federal bureaucracy began uh, during and after the civil war. In 1862, the Department of Agriculture was created. The reason for this, uh, Congress felt that in order to regulate how agriculture is traded throughout uh, the world from the United States to different countries. We needed a Department of Agriculture to uh, maintain, to monitor, and to and to uh, regulate the growth of how agriculture is done in this country. Again, in 1866, the first pension office is created, and this was done to help those who fought in the Civil War on the North side, obviously, to uh, get their pensions provided to them for serving in the Union. Department of Justice in 1870 was created not only to uh, 
not only to maintain or make sure federal laws were abided by, but it was also help many former slaves in the South during Reconstruction to make sure violence doesn't uh, doesn't uh, affect their day to day lives. It also uh, was a way in which the 14th Amendment could be abided by and and made sure that uh, the southern states applied the 14th Amendment in their states. And the authorization of thousands of new employees in order to fulfill these departments, uh, you had to have thousands and thousands of federal employees to make them work. Uh, one of the first uh, uh, federal employees during this time eventually became Frederick Douglass. He received uh, a federal appointment uh, to, uh, to work in one of the new departments and also to head uh, the Freeman thing. From the spoil system to the merit system. The patronage system of the spoil systems were federal jobs given to loyal supporters. So say, uh, especially a great example of the spoil system was Andrew Jackson. You supported Andrew Jackson, you got a federal job. No matter what, shoveling manure, cleaning the streets, working in a clerk's office, if you worked for Andrew Jackson, you got a job. However, uh, this became prog problematic over, over the years because what would happen is a new administration would take over. All these people would get new jobs because they supported the president, but you would fire, fire hundreds of well-qualified people for the job. Eventually, Congress passed the Pendleton Act, which established uh, accountability, which established permanence that no one could just simply fire someone off uh, just the fact that the administration took over unless, of course, it's a department head, but the, also that people were hired and promoted on their merit and years of service. Today, the civil service system uh, covers more than 90% of the federal employees. What you have to do in order to advance in this merit system is, of course, get hired, be qualified for that position, and gain education, knowledge, experience, and advance forward through your merits, the things that you do. And eventually, you can retire. If a new president comes in, if you're not an apartment head that has been appointed by Congress, you keep your job. Unless, of course, budgets are cut. But other than that, thanks to the merit system, we created a bureaucracy for the first time, a stable bureaucracy that was able to do the work of the American people. Anything that Congress passed, the president made into, uh, signed it into law, in which the policies of the president and the Congress was fulfilled through this bureaucracy. Regulating commerce. New agencies came about, uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887, the Federal Trade Commission in 1913, and the Department of Commerce and Labor split into two departments in 1913. Now the Interstate Commerce Commission came into effect for two major reasons. Uh, one, railroads. That's right. For the first time in history, we had, for at this time, over 50, almost 60 years of railroad growth. And nothing was really regulating this. No one was really regulating trade between uh, different states uh, that were going on. It, it was well decided in, uh, in uh, Mulberry uh, versus Madison, and then in, oh, I forget the New York case off the top of my head, and I'll probably remember it within the next uh, few moments, that federal, for trade between the states, interstate commerce was under the federal jurisdiction. But there was really nothing 
that the federal government did to regulate that. Until the Interstate Commerce Commission was born, it regulated railroads, re regulated telegraph, it, regul it started to regulate all commerce between the states. The Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, uh, start, uh, started to regulate uh, uh, not only trade between the United States and other countries, but also uh, different commodities. The Department of Commerce and Labor split into two departments in 1913. It split into the Department of Labor and the Department of Commerce in 1913. The reason why all this happened during this time is that between the end of the Civil War until the beginning of World War I, there was explosive economic growth in the United States. And the United States also grew in population and became a very, very economically complex country. And there was needed for regulation of the individual businesses. Also the 16th Amendment in 1913 allowed for a federal income tax on all citizens. Now, after the war, during the first and second war, war, during the first world war, the interwar period and the second world war, uh, our country went through great change. And we were beginning to be seen as a world power. And because of that government expanded. And when government expanded, so the government services, so the ways that government policies had to be applied. And during, especially during the Great Depression with uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's uh, social programs, uh, these programs expanded the federal government e even more. And uh, the federal bureaucracy in order to uh, get the policies in order to get money, in order to apply uh, the help that citizens needed, needed to expand it well. During World War II, exponential growth of the federal government in order for the federal government to, to uh, handle the war, to fight the war was needed. And then of course, during the Cold War, after, after World War II, uh, in which the GI Bill was created to help uh, returning veterans go to college. Uh, other programs uh, for housing came out, which we had other problems in that called redlining, and that was involved in this as well. Yes, I brought redlining up. And also the expansion of the military in order to fight communism uh, came up as well. So because of these changes, the federal government grew even more. And then explosive growth with social programs with Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society, which created the Equal Opportunity Commission, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and then the Department of Transportation. Now, formal organization of the bureaucracy. We have formal organization and government workers and political involvement. Now, the formal organization of the bureaucracy is simply made of cabinet departments, independent executive agencies, independent regulatory commissions, and government corporations. All of these little departments run the federal government as we know it. So look at this. When you, as an average citizen, look on TV and look at our elected officials in Congress, look at our president, whoever it may be, and look at our Supreme Court, we say, well, look at our government dollars at work. Because you look at the dysfunction of Congress, you're like, oh my gosh. You look at the president, if in a positive or negative way, you see good things, you can see bad things, and you may, have the same type of uh, visceral reaction. When you see uh, certain decisions come out of our court system and you're like, oh my gosh, how's that gonna be applied? 
Well, these departments, the, the different cabinet departments, the independent executive agencies, independent regulatory commissions, and these government corporations are the ones who consist of over 90% of the government are the ones who handle that day to day. Yes, members of Congress can get the movie. The president can get the movie. The, the judiciary can issue an order that they have to enforce. But these agencies actually go out and do the day-to-day -day hard work dirt of the average citizen. Everybody always wants to talk about uh, the average system or the average blue collar worker. Well, to be quite honest, these are the people who are the blue collar workers of the government. They go out there and do the day to day work. And this is what cabinet departments look like. As right now, you had the president of the United States. The cabinet is made of the Department of State which is Foreign Affairs, Department of the Treasury, speaks for itself, Department of Defense, Military, the Department of Justice, to make sure justice is sustained throughout the country and enforce the federal laws. The Department of Interior, to regulate different interior uh, areas such as our, our national parks and things such as that. The Department of Agriculture, to maintain and to uh, balance agriculture. Department of Commerce, Department of Congress, Commerce basically takes care of interstate commerce within the United States. Department of Labor regulates labor. Department of Transportation speaks for itself, regulates transportation. Department of Housing and Urban Development, it's to regulate sprawl and to help individuals who don't have housing or maintain affordable housing throughout the country. Department of Health and Human Services is basically our welfare department, which encompasses many social programs that is applied today. Department of Energy regulates our uses of energy throughout the United States. The Department of Education does nothing really but help the president issue its, uh, issue the president's uh, or Congress's educational policy and coordinates with states in implementing them. The Department of Veteran Affairs handles all complaints and issues with veteran and the Department of Homeland Security is the internal security agency that maintains protection over the United States. The Hatch Act limits federal employees from political activities. The Hatch Act was uh, passed in the 1930s. And what it says that federal employees cannot actively be involved in or receiving any money, any money at all from a political party or an organization. If you work within the government, you must maintain neutrality. You can vote whoever you want, but there will be no active political uh, involvement at all. Amendments to the Hatch Act uh, say employees may run for office in nonpartisan elections, employees may donate to political organizations, and employees may campaign for candidates while off duty. But while on duty, none. Who are the bureaucrats? Most are part of the civil service uh, system. Positions are filled through competitive exams or ranking. So look at this. If you're gonna file for a civil service job, work for one of the agencies, first thing they ask you to do before you go through an interview is to take a test to see if you have the skills and the aptitude for the position. That's it. Once you have that, you pass that round, you are actually interviewed. And then if you pass the interview, you are checked out and you are hired. But 10% of our workforce is not part of the civil service position. 3,500 are presidential appointees that must be approved by the Senate. Then another group, independent regulatory 
uh, commissions like the Federal uh, Exchange Commission or the Federal Communication Commission or other little ABC commissions are independent regulatory com uh, commissions that regulatory regulate certain uh, industries. And low level of non-policy patron positions. And what that means is, well, when you get a new president, new president can hire you for a job, but a very low level position. If you want to be hired at a higher level position, you have to compete with everything else. But if you want to work, um, uh, uh, coming into the White House or coming in on the coattails of the president, it is considered at a very low position. Decentralization. All these positions are decentralized. That means these regulatory commissions, independent regulatory commissions are independent of the president and can follow their own rules that was set by Congress. And high turnover in key positions. What that means, like the cabinet positions, there is usually high turnover, especially if it's a president that uh, that have appointed many of these people that most of these people don't believe in the president's policies or disagree with the president and usually wind up resigning. How the bureaucracy works, relationship among policy actors and making policy. Now, Relationship among policy actors include iron triangles, issue networks, interagency councils, and policy coordinating committees. Iron triangles. Everybody always likes to talk about iron triangles. Basically, you have in Congress, and as we said before, and we'll, I mean, as we're going to say here soon, as we go into interest groups uh, in, in later upcoming chapters, that interest groups uh, basically uh, lobby Congress for assistance or uh, with, with making sure uh, passing certain laws uh, that they support or killing certain laws that they don't support. Well, well bureau uh, bureaucratic agencies do the same thing but they must compete for services, for money from Congress. So what they do is create what is called an iron triangle. And we're gonna talk about this again when we get into interest groups. Basically our bureaucratic agencies will go and provide congressional committees, subcommittees, or just Congress with information that they need about a specific uh, industry. And especially if it's an industry that that bureaucratic agency may need more money to regulate. At the same time, congressional co uh, committees or subcommittees are receiving information or, or assistance from interest groups, lobbyist groups, or corporations, be in support of that bureaucratic agency or not to support that agency. At the same time, interest groups, lobbyists, large corporations go and lobby the bureaucratic agency itself to ask, hey, can we get some help on with the regulations? Not necessarily to loosen the regulations always, but a way in which they can abide by the rules without hurting their ability to make a profit. So in the same uh, context, which they trade information, they also trade it the other way. It's a triangle that goes back and forth, back and forth. They all feed on each other in this triangle. One, one helps the other, while the other one uh, helps another part. It's an iron triangle. Rule making or policy making. These agencies make independent rules. Uh, they have a quasi-legislation process, uh, regulations that, that do have some force of law, and administrative procedure acts establish a process. What this means is Congress may have set, let's say, uh, the Department of Labor. Congress established the Department of Labor in 1913. 
Congress passes a law that regulates labor in another way. The president signs this into law and must apply it to must apply it to uh, the country to regulate it. Well, Congress most likely in the law gives the Department of Labor an opportunity to make and establish rules in order to apply this policy to the country. And when these rules are established based on the law that Congress has created, co uh, these rules, once they are thought out, figured out, are applied to the industries that are under uh, the Labor Department. Now, the Labor Department breaks those rules. They are subject to fine by the Labor Department based upon the law that was created. But the but any company that may break, break a rule has a right to go through administrative adjudication in which they can appeal to the Labor Department in their judicial wing any decision that is incorrect. And even after that, if they feel that this rule or this law is unconstitutional or unfairly biased towards them, they can leave that process and actually file suit in court to legally challenge that rule or that law and then to move forward. So yes, <laughs> administrative agencies can make uh, rules in order for them to follow. Uh, administrative agencies does have a, a quasi court system in which um, independent, independent uh, people, in a, I mean, a quasi court system where these uh, uh, agencies, where these corporations uh, can, uh, can seek a judicial relief within the agency. And if they don't, they have every right to file uh, a, a lawsuit and then go to a court to challenge it. Now, this is basically a, a chart of how uh, regulation is made. And I will just keep this up here for a few moments so you can see that. Executive control. Now, the president in charge of the cabinet, in charge of these agencies, is simply delegating uh, the president's power to make the bureaucracy work. Sometimes if a president holds on to the bureaucracy too hard, it makes it difficult for them to do their job. Sometimes, depending on the president, there's a reorganization of bureaucracy. But that requires congressional approval. Remember, how these agencies function is based off law that has been approved by Congress and signed into law by the president. And executive orders and proclamations give these departments direction on how to apply that law. There may be at times, like uh, back in 19, uh, I mean, back in 2014, when President Obama ordered the Justice Department to hold all uh, enforcement of marijuana laws in states that had passed uh, medicinal or recreational marijuana. They did this through executive orders. Also, President Trump has done the same thing as in reversing those. And of course, President Biden has brought back the Obama uh, uh, exemption for those states. So executive control is just simply the delegation of power from the president to the agencies to, uh, to deliver the policy of Congress and the president throughout the country. Congressional control. Congre uh, Congress can, uh, 
can control how these uh, agencies are run by simply rejecting the appointees of the president. If Congress, especially the Senate, which authorized uh, the appointees, feel that the person that is being appointed does not qualify or will not do a good job, they can deny it and not allow them to sit on that committee or in that agency or in that corporation. Also, if Congress feels that uh, the uh, specific agency is not doing their job properly, independent members of Congress notified by individual citizens is one of the reasons why you should vote because your member of Congress actually contacts the agency and gets things done for you. And if you vote for that person, that person knows, and especially if you contribute to that campaign, they know that you cared about them very much. They do work a little extra hard. But let's just say you have an agency, even though you, or Congress, I should say, has chosen the person to lead it properly. And there, through numerous oversights and investigations, still Congress does not believe that the agency is performing well. Remember, Congress has the power to purse. So if Congress doesn't feel that that specific agency is functioning properly, well, the budget that comes out that Congress uh, establishes can leave that agency without money and can ineffectively kill it if Congress so, so desires. Judicial controls. Injunctions or orders can also be placed against an agency. An injunction is a court order telling an agency or any other body that it cannot do what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to stop, plain and simple. Also, a court can say that uh, a specific agency is not fulfilling the due process rights of individual corporations or individuals. And the simple threat of litigation against that agency which can eventually find their practice on constitution or bring bad uh, publicity to them is a powerful threat against an individual agency. Now, how are agencies made accountable? The president has the authority, the Congress has the authority too, and the judiciary has the authority too. This chart will be available for you to review. And that's it. That's it. So now what you have seen, you've seen that now you know, essentially, any law that Congress makes and that the president signs is taken from Congress, from the president, given to the bureaucracy through the agencies corporations, independent regulatory commissions, everything, and sent down to the agencies where the individuals in the agencies apply that policy to day-to-day -day operations when dealing with the public. So when you talk to a person that works with a federal agency, their rules of that agency their services that they provide is all determined by the laws that your representative that your representative has helped create. In order to get that agency to change, there's only one way to do it. You have to vote. If you don't like how the federal government is performing, if you don't like how government agencies is working for you, their real influence on this is your public opinion for whatever president that's in office right now, or your public opinion when you go to the polls and vote. 
to change Congress. You have to vote. Remember, that's why a lot of people try to limit the vote of others, because it means everything. Voting is power. If you don't vote, you get nothing done. But until next time, remember to do your best, think critically, and God bless you. And I'll see you on chapter nine next time. Thank you.